So today, what we're going to do is talk a little bit about direct RF and how it is implemented to solve problems for the embedded space at critical signal processing at the edge. Just as a review, I think most of you know, uh, we've covered it previously, what direct RF really is. What it means is replacing the traditional heterodyne receiver block diagram that you see here, which includes a analog RF front end that takes high frequency RF signals and translates those signals down in frequency to a lower frequency that an A to D converter can digitize. So the direct RF approach is to directly sample the RF signal instead of having to have it converted down to a lower frequency because A to D converters have gotten faster and faster. So direct RF sampling eliminates that front end analog frequency translation stage. And what it does is it gives you a much simpler front end where you can capture signals, as I said, directly at the RF signal frequency, eliminating all of the analog uh, components, the cost, the size, weight, power, drifting, aging, uh, phase noise, and so forth in a lo local oscillator to make you know, the, uh, the job of acquiring that signal much easier. This is a view of the IEEE-defined frequency bands. I think a lot of you have heard of those, but it's a huge array that covers the whole spectrum for you know, multiple, multiple uh, multiples of, of uh, tens in terms of low frequencies to high frequencies. And in that chart, it shows you where those bands are being used in defense applications and other applications. So there's so much out there, so many tasks that need to be done by acquiring those signals, generating those signals, taking advantage of the spectrum to get whatever mission is required at whatever frequency that particular mission works best. So having so much of the, of the uh, energy in, in, in the critical bands up now at 12, 18, 20, 24, 36 gigahertz, we now want to be able to do direct RF sampling of those frequ frequencies without having to go through that translation process. So over the years, there's been a steady increase in the sampling rate of A to D converters. And what we always did was took the fastest A to Ds we could get, put them on board level products, and capture whatever we could, but we couldn't capture the high RF signal frequencies that a lot of people really needed. So now we've got A to D converters that can sample up to 64 giga samples per second, and those have generated a whole new interest in this concept of direct RF, which now is real, and it's there, and it's being deployed. Let's take a look. This is a, a small, kind of a nutshell diagram of, of, a, of a direct RF transceiver, and it shows at the top the input side, which takes the antenna signal, does some filtering and gain, and then a direct RF sampling. The samples go into an FPGA, typically, could be another processing element. They then come back out of the FPGA if it's a transponder or electronic countermeasures, for example, or a communication system to go to a digital up converter and a D to A converter, converting it back to the RF antenna signal frequency right at the D to A converter, goes out through a power amplifier back to the, to the transmit uh, antenna signal. So th this is the very simplified diagram of what a lot of military defense electronic systems require. And the way that direct RF components and devices are, are created, and a lot of different form factors and a lot of different techniques the first one is a mezzanine card, where you have the FPGA on the main carrier card. In this case, we've got a 3U VPX uh, SOSA-aligned card, and a, a place for a mezzanine or a daughter card to go on. And that makes a perfectly good um, direct RF solution. Another technique has been like with the RF SOC from Xilinx, which, which we've used for the last five years with great success. It's a monolithic device that includes the A to D converters and the D to A converters sampling at five and 10 gigahertz right on the same monolithic device with the FPGA. 
So that's one package that contains the whole solution, so it's called a system on chip, SOC, okay? Another solution is called system in package. Now what this is, it's a multi-chip module, which means instead of having everything on one monolithic chip, you have multiple die that are joined together, usually on a substrate, in a package, so that the chip for the uh, FPGA can be tied directly to the, to the chiplets, they're called, for the data converters, the A to D converters and the D to A converters, all combine in a package. And here's a couple of examples of, of Intel and uh, a Mercury SIP. Okay. And the last one is a system on module. So this is SOM. And what this means is you have an RF, direct RF um, capability on a small printed circuit board module that then can be portable so that that SOM or system on module can be used to implement an end product that's a, say, a Vita uh, open VPX product, a SOSA aligned 3U, VP, uh, 3U product, PCI Express, or it can go into custom form factors like a rugged enclosure, uh, a subsystem. It can also go into a customer designed carrier card where the customer then can use the SOM as a really fast way of getting his product to market because all the hard work for designing with that uh, chip is done on the SOM itself. So these are different techniques and architectures that we've used. Just a quick look, I think most of you know what a uh, system in package, a multi-chip module looks like. You have the FPGA in the center here. You have the chiplets for the A to D and D to A converter connected through uh, direct bonding, often through a substrate, uh, that connect them very intimately, very, very short paths, short direct paths. And there are fab fabs in the US now, uh, uh, Intel and Mercury has a fab in Phoenix for uh, a full accredited um, uh, US-based facility, which is very attractive to our uh, DOD. Here's an example of a Stratix 10AX. This is from Intel, uh, who acquired Altera a few years back. And here we've got a, a die in the middle with four, uh, eight channels of 64 gigas sample per second, A to D, D to A, using chiplets bonded directly to that uh, device, the uh, FPGA device in the center. Now this device then can be also put on a, let's say a 3U VPX card, and that's shown here. This is, this is a 3U VPX, open VPX. You can see the inputs and outputs on the front panel in this case, with four inputs, four outputs, sampling, in this case, up to 51.2 giga samples per second. This is capable, capable of capturing signals and generating signals up to about 18 gigahertz, which covers a very important band for a huge range of defense and military applications. Another example of a combination is a Versal, which is a, a, a Xilinx, which now has been acquired by AMD, RF system and package. And then this, this is a mercury uh, system and package where we take the Versal ACAP AI device, artificial intelligence version of Versal, connect it to, two, uh, uh, to, to a transmit receive chiplet family that gives us the, the uh, uh, four channels of analog input, analog output. So it's another way of doing it, another manufacturer of the FPGA, a different type. And this is then ready to go on a board or a product. Another Versal family, this one featuring the high bandwidth memory, which is tremendous band memory bandwidth because the, the memory is right embedded in the FPGA itself. So there are a lot of compute intensive applications where you need extremely high memory bandwidth and this, this provides it. In this case, we have a mezzanine card uh, construct for the, for, the, for the product, where in the uh, first case, we've got um, the, the, uh, the first product, the first mezzanine product, will be based on the new analog devices Apollo family. 
the MXFE, which gives us four channels of 20 gigasample per second input and 20 gigasample per second on the D2A output as a mezzanine card. The flexibility here is that you can always change the front end with a, when a new direct RF data converter comes out by plugging it in. Recently, Intel announced their Agilex 9 series, which is a, a very advanced, the latest FPGA technology that, that uh, Altera uh, Intel has. It has tremendous amounts of, of FPGA resources based on a 10 nanometer process. It has four or eight, depending on which of these two chips you're talking about, uh, channels in and out. And the larger one, the O27 on the right there, has twice the number of, of FPGA resources as the, the O14, which is the one on the left. So it matches the processing capability with the fact that you've got twice as many channels. So this also has an, another major advantage in that the connection that's made between the chiplets, the data converter chiplets and the FPGA are parallel using the AIB Advanced Interconnect Bus to give you extremely low latency, which is vital for a lot of uh, electronic countermeasure systems, okay? So what we said was, how do we do that? How do we get that chip to market so people can use it in open architecture systems? We decided to, to use a system on module approach, which proved to be so effective for us in our Quartz family. And so we're, um, we're gonna be creating this module, releasing it today, at yesterday at the show. Uh, so it's brand new, just released. And it's based on the, uh, the O14 product, the first one that has four channels of in and out. And we also are developing a RF interface that will go right next to this, uh, this system on module that, I, that we, we see here to give you a customizable RF front end using Mimics and other very small, very compact devices many of them offered by Mercury's uh, MMIC, formerly Atlanta Micro Division, because they've, they've miniaturized so many RF uh, front end functions. They can really fit a lot of uh, RF signal processing right on that little mezzanine card. The first card we're gonna be using as a carrier will be a 3U VPX, open VPX, SOSA aligned carrier. And that, you can see that looks like this. So this gives us the flexibility to put it on different carriers, but the 3U VPX SOSA is very important. And this gives us the ability to, to customize it a little bit with the RF interface. And it also allows us to, to you know, see a, a roadmap for a lot of different families, members of this, not just the SOSA aligned 3U VPX, but a PCI Express carrier, a rugged enclosure with that module inside, a subsystem that could be used for a UAV, and a carrier, custom carrier that's divine, defined by, our, uh, uh, by what our customer needs, so he can build his own carrier for that zone. So again, a very fast way to get the new technology into service and delivered. I wanna just show you a real quick, this is one scenario for how people could be using the uh, front end uh, of a edge-centric acquisition system for a multi-function radio. So you have a phased array antenna, you have the direct RF data converters in and out, the digital connections are made through a, a network a switch controller that then can feed different parts of the spectrum to different functional requirement systems on board of a platform, a vehicle or ship or whatever. And each of those different um, end uses, radar or SIGINT or a tactical mission, can then decide which, which bands they need and which signals they need, and that front end then can deliver it across a network. It's a very, uh, very flexible and very powerful, and it, it can adapt over time simply by changing the assignment of, of the bands to the different consumers. 
So direct RF has a lot of advantages. Higher signal bandwidths, we talked about that. Acquisition at the edge, we just looked at it. The lower signal latency with that direct connection between the data converters and the FPGA. Heterogeneous computing with AI and ML, a lot of different types of FPGA capabilities. The multi-radio, we just looked at. Higher signal in, uh, complexity with uh, many more additional FPGA resources available. Phased arrays by shrinking the size, weight, and power of each channel. If you've got 1,000 channels or 100 channels in your phased array, you've saved all of that RF down conversion circuitry 1,000 or 100 times. So it gives a huge advantage. And the stair mode capability, what that means is that you can look continuously at a very wide band instead of having to scan to find something. So you can stare at a, at a target um, and, and actually be able to look at everything in real time within that band. So Mercury has a lot of solutions for RF and microwave. We have a lot of different divisions in the Mer Mer Mercury processing platform. And what that Mercury processing platform really is, it's a, it's a unique offering to our customers that distinguishes us from, from other companies. And what it really does is it, it allows the technology that, and the capabilities that Mercury has acquired and developed over the last 40 years to be used for critical signal processing solutions at the edge. It includes the complete signal chain from signal acquisition and generation through signal processing, computing, network connections over to storage devices, and often to uh, uh, displays so that um, the customer can get a, a view of the data through to, to the decision factor so that he can act on the intelligence that that signal chain processing path has delivered. These solutions are available as components, as modules and boards, as subsystems, and as complete systems from Mercury to solve whichever level the customer needs. And finally, the processing platform delivers to our customers systems that are mission ready, they're trusted and secure, they are configurable with software, they're software defined so they're flexible, and they're open architecture based and they're, they're really ready for, to, to go to bring the latest signal processing capabilities that are out there ready to go for mission critical edge applications. So that's what we do.